Hi, this is Scott Suddeth with uh, Washington Navigators. We're uh, pleased to uh, work with uh, Campus Compact on their federal agenda in Washington, D.C., and we're excited uh, to uh, pre present the membership with the federal update, and we're very excited to have Kara Jarzinski from Resolutionary with us today. We're going to talk with uh, Kara about the uh, uh, build a uh, civic uh, bridge building act that has been introduced in both the House and the Senate in this session of Congress. And I'm sure Kara is not only going to tell us what the legislation is all about and uh, the role for Campus Compact and other uh, entities to play in civic discourse and civic engagement, but she's also going to tell us that the bill is going to pass before this Congress adjourns. One of the few things that I'm I'm sure that the, this Congress uh, can accomplish in a bipartisan manner. Okay, sorry to set you up there, Kara, but uh, but welcome to the conversation with our Campus Compact community today. Thank you for having me. The work that you all do is really important and really fantastic. So I'm thrilled that we've been able to have a have this partnership and in, uh, in working to create better civic engagement for all of the nation, but especially through students in higher ed. They're an important demographic for sure. So tell us about, I know you've been working for some time, not only your organization, but uh, a broader coalition that you helped bring together and Campus Compact has been excited to be a member of for the past year. But you've been working for some time on uh, both the concept and specifically legislation on uh, uh, building civic engagement and bridge building. Tell, tell us uh, you know, a little bit about that experience and where we are. Sure. You know, what's interesting is, and I'm not going to say anything that's surprising. In 2021, for the first time, the United States was added to the list of backsliding democracy uh, democracies by the International Institution for Democracy and Electoral Assistance which is mind blowing. So here we are, this is the problem. We've been added to the list of backsliding democracies. Then comes the part where we talk about what are the solutions to that? How do we change that? Um, we've all felt it. Obviously the temperature in politics is getting hotter. Um, how we're reacting. Certainly there was a, a quite a bit of heat happening on college campuses around politics as well earlier this year. So then you really have to look at brass tacks. What are the solutions to stop the backsliding and to re-engage students and people in the community in civics and have it be something that doesn't feel like something dirty or scary or whatever is keeping people away, but actually something that is positive and attainable and buildable for us all, uh, which is how, how the bill emerged. The Building Civic Bridges Act was written by Representative De Derek Kilmer, a Democrat out of Washington. And when he wrote it, he brought on, because bar bipartisanship was very important to him, Andy Barr, a Republican out of Kentucky. Now, why did the bill come about? Obviously, that, that bigger thing about backsliding democracy. But what specifically happened in Representative Kilmer's district was unfortunately some acts of violence he got a call from the local YMCA to come visit. And the reason why they wanted him there is because there had been fights breaking out in the gym at the elliptical machine over the politics that people were watching while they were working out. And it wasn't just once or twice, it was so bad that this YMCA called in a conflict resolution specialist to help train their board and their staff. How do we get through this? And they asked Representative Kilmer, is there any federal support for something like this? Now, what happened a little bit later is that there was a several acts of assault on faith leaders. An Islamic center was burned to the ground, a church was vandalized, and two Buddhist leaders were attacked outside their temple. Now, their decision in this pro problem was to find a solution that would bring people together. Not to aggravate it further, but how do we take this horrible thing that happened and actually knit community together even further? And so they held an interface solidarity event. And they, too, asked Derek Kilmer, is there any sort of support for this? Because we can see things are getting worse. 
and we want to have solutions at the ready. So what he, Derek Kilmer did was he looked into it. Does the federal government have any sort of civic engagement or programs that bring people together across lines of difference? And what he found is that the federal government actually does. Every year, the federal government in our budget allocates $315 million to the National Endowment for Democracy. And that $315 million forms uh, initiatives and funds all sorts of programs that will help knit communities together, um, secure democracy, be um, initiatives for civic engagement. But we spend all of that money overseas. Absolutely none of it is spent here at home. So he wrote the Building Civic Bridges Act in modeled after the National Endowment for Democracy, which we already know is efficacious. And we already know that the federal government believes in it. And so he did it mm -hmm. for us here domestically here at home. And so uh, this has been introduced in the House, and I believe it also ha uh, has uh, bipartisan support in the Senate. It sure um, does. So tell us a little bit about uh, the specifics. Uh, so it goes to AmeriCorps, correctly? It so and, what it would do, and, mm -hmm. yeah. it, cr it would create an office of civic bridge building within AmeriCorps. The benefits of having it be in AmeriCorps are numerous. Number one, AmeriCorps already has <laughs> a bajillion of volunteers embedded into the community. And some of those are students who are doing their gap year after high school. And a lot of them are actually seniors who have already exited the workforce and are engaging in the community. Um, what's beautiful about AmeriCorps is that they can take federal dollars and add private donations to it. So it's not relying completely on the federal government. It's allowing the federal government to say this is important and then welcoming other funding in. In addition, AmeriCorps has this beautiful return to communities for every $1 of federal government money that they receive. They return at an, an average of $17 back to the community. So it's a really great return on investment. So by um, setting up the BCBA in AmeriCorps, it would allow all of the AmeriCorps volunteers to be trained in bridge building to help create um, bridges across lines of difference so that when they're already embedded in the community, they're they're ready to take action when they see it. And it would also create grants. Um, in the pilot, three-year pilot program, $15 million a year, so that you're talking about $45 million, that would go to organizations working at a hyper-local hyper level to bridge across lines of difference and to get those demographics that have some differences to be civically engaged. And I will share happily for the people on this call that one of the entities that is eligible to receive and apply for these grants are institutions of higher ed. Yes, uh, I'd like to underscore that to those of you who are listening. Uh, higher education is eligible uh, for mm -hmm. the funding and the grants in this program. Kara, if I recall correctly, there's also a provision that uh, addresses uh, research uh, that is going forward um, that AmeriCorps would want to collect sort of uh, best practices and, and really kind of do some, do some uh, research based on the demonstration projects over the first three years of what works, what doesn't work, and how can we become even more effective at this going forward. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. There have been some studies about the efficacy of bridge building. Um, the Fetzer Institute has done them. Stanford has done quite a bit. Um, there's also the Bridging Movement Alignment Council has a, a, a goals and measures working group where they're really looking at that as well. But the answer is we need more. We need to make sure that we're the most efficacious methods of bringing people across lines of difference, that those are the methods that are being done. So what's great is that not only are will this bill help to get people on the ground right away working, and it will also make sure that as the work continues, that that research will be done so that we, we can make sure that it's in the best method possible. 
Well, this legislation is obviously uh, at the intersection of what uh, the campus compact community does and does best, which is uh, engaging with the communities in which the universities re reside and engaging with them in a variety of, uh, of ways. But uh, this would certainly uh, provide a role for uh, Campus Compact uh, to engage students and in, in uh, as well as faculty in working with the community in in new and important ways. Um, and I know you've been walking the halls of Congress uh, personally, along with a broad coalition of business leaders, uh, interfaith organizations, other community-based organizations. Can you give us both a sense of where you see the legislation moving uh, and more importantly, what role can uh, the Campus Compact uh, members play in advocacy? Oh, well, let me <laughs> first address your question about the coalition. And I will say the coalition of support for this is broad. There are close to 60 national organizations who have officially endorsed the bill. In addition, there are more than 100 who do not feel that they're in a place that they can officially endorse legislation, but they have committed to helping in other ways. And that coalition of support includes um, organizations of higher ed, K through 12 education, of course, but it also includes mental health organizations who see obviously the Surgeon General with his report on the epidemic of loneliness, so that one of the keys to that is knitting together the fabric of community and having civic engagement. Um, there are also organizations that are just local and working on the ground level. There's a lot of religious organ organizations who really see the breakdown of the fabric of our society and are really looking to how do we knit this back up. And it, when you look at all of those organizations, the story that it tells is that there's a lot of people that are working really hard to help shore up our communities and our institutions, but they need help because the changes that are happening in our culture are changing so quickly. It's one of those moments that it's all hands on deck. And I think that's one of the reason that that coalition of support not only includes those organizations, but it also includes some pretty heavy hitters in, in terms of names. So, General Michael Hayden, who's the former head of the CIA and the NSA, he has published op one op-ed already in support of the Building Civic Bridges Act. There is a second op-ed that he also then reached out to some of his colleagues that are three and four-star generals, uh, former head of national intelligence, uh, James Clapper, as along with General Stanley McChrystal, who of course led f forces in Afghanistan. And these gentlemen come at the, the standpoint that if we do not civically engage, if we do not inspire the next generation that will take the lead to civically engage, then what will ha what is happening now becomes a very, very serious threat to democracy. And these national intelligence, they and national security experts, they come at it from that perspective that if we are not together as a nation, then we are vulnerable to forces who are apart. So, you know, when you get when you get the former head of the CIA and the NSA saying, listen, people, we need to civically engage. I mean, I listen. <laughs> I'm like, yes, sir, got it. And it's so much that we've actually, General McChrystal has joined us um, for some of our meetings. We actually met with Speaker Johnson's office a couple of weeks ago and General McChrystal was there. And the the lessons he, the stories he tells are, are really powerful lessons of what happens in communities and in societies when the fabric of culture and government and democracy begins to fail, how quickly it fails and what happens. So he is saying, let's not do that. <laughs> let's engage our students, let's engage the people in community, and let's build. Let's start here. And the beautiful part is that democracy, because it is, and, and here, I'll just quote General Hayden. He said, our democracy is fundamentally based on debate, 
dialogue, and the free exchange of ideas. Tragically, misinformation and polarization have made communication difficult and full of mistrust on all sides. We must rebuild our national strength and security by coming together to work out the differences that threaten to destroy our democracy from within and without. I will add to this, um, Chuck Welch, um, who's of course the president of, of ASCU, the American Association of State Colleges and University Universities, he has also written an op-ed in support of the Building Civic Bridges Act. And for him, the question is one of, if America is a backsliding democracy, what is the role of higher ed? What is the role of college campuses? And his answer is, and I'll quote him as well, college campuses play a critical role in supporting civic life in communities across the country that reflect the nation's diverse and divergent ideas, beliefs, and experiences. College campuses are home to the practice of democracy itself. Now, I will add to this a very practical thing. College campuses are training the next generation of workers. And another key demographic that's part of that coalition of support for this bill are business organizations, the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, state business executives, Business for America. And why do businesses care so much about people being able to bridge across lines of difference? And the answer, I can... There, there's tons of them, but I will quantify it into one number, which is $2 billion a day. SHRM just came out with a new study at the beginning of August that the cost of workers not being able to have conversations across lines of difference costs businesses over $2 billion a day. So if you want to link that back up That's to higher money. ed, it's a lot of money. Yeah a lot of money. And the fact is that, that that study doesn't actually add in some other factors of the cost to the economy at large. There's a, an economist out of the Federal Reserve in Virginia. Her name's Marina Azamonte. And she's really looked at the cost of polarization and incivility to the, the economy at large. That's an even bigger number. But if you're just looking at businesses, the cost of incivility the cost of workers not being able to have those soft skills of communicating across lines of difference, of of doing all of the work, of all of the all the skills that we know people need to have to be able to civically engage, those skills of civic engagement are the soft skills that businesses are looking for in their employees that will be gold. And by the way, there was also an op-ed published in the New York Times that talked about what are the skills that the next generation of workers will need? And the argument that was made in there is that AI is going to take over a lot of brain power. But what AI cannot do is create relationships between people. That's something that is uniquely human. And that is something that can be most effectively learned through the practice of civic engagement. Which, and, which helps strengthen democracy, not only abroad, but here at home. That's right. Uh, Kara, I was uh, at a, uh, on a college campus uh, last week. Uh, president was speaking to the incoming class of freshmen. Mm -hmm. And uh, this president was talk talking about uh, civic discourse on campus. And, he, and, and the president said, you know, it's not surprising that uh, most of us don't practice it very well. Because frankly, uh, when we look at political today, debate today, and for the last uh, decade, if not longer, uh, it's been filled with uh, acrimony and, disc and, and, uh, and very little civic discourse. And mm -hmm. this president was saying to the students that we're going to learn how to do it better. Good. Uh, because you're going to be the next leaders. And this is not... Uh, a good uh, 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 practice that you've been witnessing on social media for the last decade or so. So hopefully uh, this legislation will uh, not only help communities, but also get more members of Congress 
thinking about more effective ways of uh, discourse, even at committee hearings. Yes, I agree. I agree. I've seen some of those committee <laughs> hearings this year. They were, I, I really think they could do better <laughs> to yeah. model behavior yeah. for sure. So I think perhaps one of the things that our campus compact members can do is to, when when members of Congress are back visiting on campus in the communities, make them aware that this bipartisan bill is out there. And the more co-sponsors that uh, we can get uh, for this legislation, whether it passes this year or not, in fact, it would show momentum mm -hmm. and support as mm -hmm. we transition through this election cycle into the next Congress. You know, I had a, I had a conversation. So we've met with a lot of people and that I take as good news that when we have sent out requests to meet that there are a lot of offices that have engaged. So I, I will, I will offer up this invitation to your members right now. Um, if anyone would like us would like to join us for those meetings, I am thrilled to loop you in to any meeting that has to do with your congressional delegation. And a lot of organizations have actually really been grateful for that opportunity because what it allows them to do is to say, here on our campus, these are the problems that we see and these are the solutions that we are bringing to the table. And also we need help. So asking what that allows them to do is to just reinforce messaging with their elected officials of the work that is happening on their own campus and also what further could be done. Um, so if anyone wants to do that, please reach out to our office. I'm happy to loop you into any of those congressional meetings with their district. And you can toot Aaron, your own. Yeah. Number two. We appreciate. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, um Number two, what I will say, one of the members of Congress with whom we met was really rather clear and blunt. I said, how much longer is this behavior going to go on in Congress? And he said, well, as long as the, the American people want us to behave this way, we will behave this way. And I said, well, I, I don't know if the American people really want you to believe behave this way. And he said, well, this is the feedback we're getting. They like it when this happens. So now I could have a whole conversation about obfuscation of responsibility about that one, however, and what it means to be a leader. But what I do know is that when leadership steps up to say, we expect this behavior. We need this from our elected officials. And this is what's happening in district and what we need to support work that the elected officials are, are listening. And the fact that we have been working on this for some time and it's been in the past four weeks that the response from Congress has been really furious and fast after crickets and all of a sudden everyone's wanting to know about this bill, that tells me something about what's happening in Washington. And so now is the time to message. And, right. um, and it also says something about what's happening uh, on the ground uh, yep. that they are beginning to hear from uh, uh, constituents and stakeholders yep. that uh, yep. the status quo can't continue. Yeah. Uh, we should also acknowledge uh, speaking of leadership, uh, Senator Coons, Democrat of Delaware, and Senator Young, Republican of Indiana, who That's right. uh, are stepping up and co-sponsoring this bill in the Senate and trying to achieve the uh, the same result with their colleagues. That's right. And I, I want to mention something about Senator Young. He's a veteran. And that's actually one of the another key demographic that we've had a lot of support from our veterans groups. Um because when you're in the military, it's not about party. It's about the nation and putting the nation first. Well, you're absolutely right, Kara. We really appreciate uh, you taking time to join Campus Compact today for an update on this uh, promising legislation. And we appreciate uh, your boots on the ground uh, on Capitol Hill.
can to, I to, can uh, I help add get one this thing. cross finish line? Scott, can I add one thing very Please. quickly? Um, if people want to support, the best way to support this bill is to write a letter of support. And we, our office can use one letter in five ways. So one letter for you, real short, doesn't take a lot of time, but we can use it in five ways, which is we can send it to your congressional delegation. We can send it to the help committee in the Senate, the education and workforce committee in the house. If you wish, you can publish it in your own newsletter to help gain support from your people. And then also, if you wanted, you could utilize that exact letter and submit it to your local paper as an op-ed. So it's a it's a real good use of time. And I'm real grateful for your time. Thank you, Scott. Well, we are too. And those are excellent recommendations. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I know that uh, members do pay attention to what uh, pops up in their local newspapers. So it's true. They do. They thanks. Get that. Thank you, Kara. Thank you.